Hello, guys. Hi. Uh, Angliff, <laughs> show Schofield. I just like to okay. say it's an absolute honour to be here today um, in Zurich. Uh, both Joe and I have been here now for three days. Yeah. We've actually fallen in love with this beautiful city. Um, so much so we, we want to open a restaurant here. So it's, uh, no, it's actually beautiful and uh, it's an honour to be here. Let's go. Cool. Ganz eine wichtige Information noch, wir haben hier natürlich auch noch heute als Premiere, wird das alles hier live übertragen, also wer jetzt zu Hause zuschaut oder unterwegs auf irgendeinem Mobile-Gerät, der kann natürlich diese Show jetzt auch über YouTube oder auf Facebook ähm, bei äh, Chef Erbs genießen, allerdings so richtig genießen und riechen und schmecken kann man das nur hier vor Ort. I already told, we're live on Facebook, we're live on YouTube, but I think the real smell, the real taste you don't have. No on a video, you have it right here. And what we are talking about today, about taste, about smelling yeah. things. So today, I suppose, something a lot of people expect from Tipton Club is to see the food, um, the food and the drinks. Uh, today, Joe and I are going to be talking more about what we've been working on for the last couple of years, which is our sensorium menus, mm -hmm. something unique, something that Tipton Club has pioneered and we've been working on now, yeah, for uh, two and a half, nearly three years. That's right. So each one of the projects we're about to show you today is over 10 months' work for one project. So there's a lot that goes into the back of house. But so you can all understand what Tipplin Club's about, we're going to talk a little bit about the restaurant first. Mm -hmm. So just one little information. You've already heard there's both guys that are from England. The one here from Manchester. The other one somewhere from the nowhere between somewhere, Bristol somewhere and somewhere London. Yeah, exactly. Wiltshire, uh, Wessex, yeah. somewhere in the region, I think. So yeah. this is a good practice for us. For good old English, let's go, guys. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. So today, basically, I don't want to turn my back to you guys, but today, like, we're going to show a lot of videos. We're going to make you two drinks. But there's also some things on your chairs that are going to become more apparent as the explanation and this talk goes on. So Tipling Club was established by myself 10 years ago. It's 10 years this year. For me, this is a monument. Uh, there's not many places in Singapore last that long. But Tipling Club is about food and drink, it's about food and cocktails, but it's about fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously, as you can see, we're having fun already, we're enjoying ourselves, we, we like to do what we do. But we're going to show you a short video that is technically filmed from 6 a.m. until 1 a.m. This is what we call the day in the life of Tipling Club. Do you have it? Uh, what's important to understand as well about Tipling Club is that we were the first progressive avant cocktail bar in the, in the city. Obviously, forget Raffles Hotel and the Singapore Sling, we were the first ones to do something unique and innovative. Okay. Play the video, guys. Oh, 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 
So that's for you guys who don't know us. So again, uh, we enjoy ourselves in Singapore. Singapore's a beautiful country. Um, You know, we're we're lucky to have our place there. Uh, What we're gonna talk to you now is a little bit about our menu. A lot of people see the Tipping Club logo and they think it is a fishbone or they think it is something else. The logo is based on my chain of thought. It's about my thought process. Everything starts with a straight line, which is the timeline. Every line coming down equates to uh, a process or an ingredient. Yeah? When we draw the line down, then we start with a concept. That's how we create everything at the restaurant. The, first, the actual Tipping logo is also based on the first dish I ever created at Tipping Club, which was simply just foie gras and apple. The line is for foie gras. The lines coming down are for the individual components that we find with it. Once we've created this, it, this can take up to three months at the restaurant and we can have up to 1,000 lines of ingredients. We can have up to 25,000 concepts that we will apply to those individual ingredients. Once we've done it and we actually create the dish, this is the unique part of Tipping Club. We have a mind map of everything my R&D team and myself have done, but it's printed. We hand that to this guy here. This guy here now has my mind map of every single component and technique we've used, and that is how the bar team at Tipping Club create the flavoring, the, the cocktail pairing that goes with it. That's right. So along the bottom there, you can see all the pairing options. I mean, we were the first people to introduce the cocktail pairing philosophy to Asia. I and mean, because of that, people come to expect it. But we don't want to force it onto the food or force it onto our guests. If a dish will naturally work better with a nice wine or an interesting beer or an interesting sake, we do that. Flavor always comes first for us. So, a few dishes from the restaurant, something that's, uh, you know, some of our signatures we've done. We always, again, the foie gras apple in the top left. Um, But what you guys have on the seats, this is what we're going to get into next, okay? So, in the middle of this picture, you have a little round or or, a little round orange sphere. This is our Mandarin asteroid. Now, I don't know if you guys should all have these on your chairs. So, I don't know if you're sitting on them or if you've already picked them up and put them in your pocket. But I want you to pull them out now. You have three black cards on your chair. And this is where we're going to go into the next stage of what Tipling Club and Sensorium is about. Yeah, I think you're all sitting on it. Well done. (laughs) So what I want you to do is pick up the the middle one. You have one that has a picture of a lollipop, one that has a picture of a spaceship, and one that has a picture of a rain cloud. Okay? I want you to smell the one that has a picture of the spaceship. Okay? So this is something nobody in this audience would have ever done and you will never do in your lifetime, but we worked three years ago with NASA to develop the scent of outer space. Now, the card that has the picture of the spaceship, I want you to smell the spaceship. So when NASA was still in orbit with their astronauts, we took the suits of the astronauts. When they got back to Earth, they were distilled, solvent extracted, and we created a very small, minute amount of distillate that is technically how outer space smells. It was then certified by NASA, certified by the astronauts. But in the restaurant, what we do is we serve something which is called the Mandarin and Madras Curry Asteroid. We don't have them for you today, it's too much, but the idea is behind it. When we put the distillate into a machine called a mass gas spectrometer to analyze the ingredients that we use or that we distilled from the spacesuits, it gave us the ingredients of mandarin and madras curry. 
the machine didn't understand what it was smelling. So what you're smelling now, you might smell as burnt metal. You're actually smelling the sweat of the astronauts as well. <laughs> um, and also the surrounding areas of, the, of when they went on their space walks. Mm. But if you put this into a machine, a mass gas spectrometer, you're actually going to analyze smells of mandarin and madras curry. So in the restaurant, when we serve this, when you eat it, we ask you to smell first, then eat the mandarin asteroid, and it balances your refractory senses. Mm. Okay? So this is actually part of the way we serve our cocktail menus in the bar. Say, for example, the bags of gummy bears that you have, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, everybody gets one menu card or one set of the aroma menu between four. We want people to take it, share, pass it around, and talk about the experience that they're having at Tippling Club. R&D Lab is the next thing you want to talk about. You know, we're very lucky to have this in the restaurant. You know, Tippling Club's 10 years old now. This is you know, a personal investment by the restaurant. We're never going to be rich. We're never going to drive a Ferrari or an RS6 or something. I don't know. We, we prefer to spend our money on gadgets and toys in the restaurant. But for us, the, the R&D kitchen of Tippling is the hub. You know, we have a few guys that work on there on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're very fortunate to be able to have the access to this facility um, on the second floor of my restaurant. But it's something that's important to us to grow and to develop and to do what we're doing. That's right. So in the back corner there, just along the left, uh, we have a machine called a PolyScience Sonic Prep. Yep. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. We're going to use that to um, apply a specific technique into our cocktails. So this is our first Sensori menu. We launched this a couple of years ago. Um, but before we talk a little bit more about it, we've got another video to show you um, so you can understand a little bit more about the process concept. that goes into it. Click, click. Thank you. So 
So next is the whole reason this event started or what we started doing. So about nine years ago, I started working very closely with a company called IFF, uh, also known as International Flavors and Fragrances. They're one of the first major perfume companies ever established. And I was approached by them to start doing development work on savory and sweet flavors. Um, from this was born a very lengthy relationship that has now stemmed into what we're doing today. And this is something very proud of. It's something that not a lot of restaurants have access to. As we were joking earlier about telling you guys, this is as simple as picking up the phone or sending an email. Um, it's about approaching companies and asking them for help or having a vision and asking for support. There's a million companies out there and there's young chefs that have amazing visions, but they don't do anything with it. And I think there's something that more people need to get behind. There's so many companies that want to support this whole movement or are able to help us. So. That's right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of this menu. And the whole concept was triggering memory through aroma. And obviously, that is the best way to do so, right? You know, when you're walking down the street and you smell freshly cut grass, it takes you back to that moment in your childhood. And we want our guests to relive those cherished childhood memories. And it's all to do with the way the brain works, the part of the brain which is responsible for associative learning and also the olfactory um, element are very close. And often, what is very much overlooked, not necessarily in the food world, but definitely in the bar world, is how important aroma is. It's estimated that 80% single uh, sorry, 80 of um, flavor comes from a process called retronasal olfaction. So that's when you're eating or drinking, and you're having aroma molecules pushed up into your nasal cavity. So um, the drink we're going to make from you, uh, for you today is from that menu. Um, it's a drink called our Sonic Negroni. This has almost become uh, our signature drink, if we had one. You know, we get guests coming in every single day um, ordering it. Um, what we do is, uh, Ryan will tell you a little bit about the science um, behind the sonic homogenization process. But it's relatively a classic Negroni with different proportions of gin, combination of sweet vermouths from all over the world, and Campari. And uh, yeah, obviously being a restaurant bar, aperitifs are very important to us. So what most people don't think as well is that the most important ingredient in uh, cocktails is actually your ice. Without having good quality ice, it's impossible to be able to make good drinks. So we pour that, and then we just pour our pre-mixed uh, Negroni mix into the glass, and then we'll finish it off yep. with the Negroni slice. So, seems boring, seems very obvious, but what's gone into this product first? If you list the ingredients, again. So we have uh, Ford's Gin from London, we have a Campari from Milano in Italy, and then we have a combination of sweet vermouths, Cocchi Torino and Martini Rosso. Okay, then what's interesting is what we do with it next is we place it into a machine, which we pointed before, which again was not possible for us to bring this piece of equipment with us, but it's called a sonic prep. The sonic prep is a machine that passes sound waves through liquid. It's used in the chemical and petrol industry to fuse water molecules or, or high-performance chemical molecules into petrol. That's how it was first discovered. We use it to basically either blend water and oil together, but in the bar side, where at Sensorium or at Tippling Club, what we use it to do is to basically open and collapse the molecules of oxygen inside a liquid. It's also used a lot in the wine industry. I hope there's nobody here that produces wine. It's going to argue with me. But uh, you are using it, we know you're using it, and it's how you open it and expand the molecules of oxygen within wine to basically age it quicker. So by taking a very boring table wine, you can turn it into a very nice uh, Montrachet or a, a Grand Cru Burgundy very quickly. It takes about 30 seconds. But what happens is, by taking our vermouth, uh, our bitters, and everything else, and our gin, we place it into the sonic prep, and within 30 seconds, we've added the equivalent of about 25 years of aging. A lot of bartenders, I'm sure there's some in the room now, are putting cocktails into barrels and saying they have a barrel-aged cocktail. That's great. But uh, with that becomes inconsistencies. You get the flavor from the wood. Now we just have the characteristics with none of that additional woody flavor. No. So the drink itself is finished. It's essentially a 30-year-old Negroni. 
Um, we're going to pass this to someone very lucky in the audience in a second to drink it. Um, it's topped off with a confit orange. And again, we're going to hit on this in a second. We have 24 minutes left. We'll hit on this in a second. Something about the concept we're trying to show you as well is about the garnish. We've actually finally realized or we've finally worked on a way where the bartenders work exclusively with the chefs. You know, they come to us. A lot of people think that all our garnishes for our drinks at Tipling Club come from the pastry kitchen. No, they're developed by myself and Joe. Mm. Then the bartenders are trained, and then the bartenders have their own space within the R&D kitchen mm. where they produce this on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Okay, so the, the, the garnish for this is actually just a confit uh, orange from Seville. We've taken the same cocktail. We've added just a little... Uh, a little blend of kappa, gelin, and agar. So it's a synergistic blend mm. of hydrocolloids. So by adding small doses, dosages, sorry, <laughs> small dosages of the same hydrocolloids, we get a synergistic blend which gives it more strength. Yeah. But the final product is a jelly that also breaks really easy. It doesn't eat like gelatin. It eats the same texture as you would eat a confit orange. That's the drink. Next slide. So and what you also have on your chairs as well is our favorite aroma from the first sensory menu. If you don't mind pulling them out, it's the one with the little rain cloud. You know, me as a bartender, obviously I spend my days working in a bar using distilled spirits. And what I love most about the smell of rain, the, the actual smell of rain is called petrichor. And that is the technical term for the natural distillation of the soil. So, so if you have your cards, there's a little rain cloud, smell it. Yeah. Yeah, got it? Cool. You're not sitting on it still? Cool. Next slide. So, so we're again we're about to show you our final video for today. And um, this is our current cocktail menu. I'll tell you a little bit about it more in just a moment. As, as you can tell, I don't know if you've seen from the videos, we always get our staff to do the video, so they're always the ones drinking the cocktails. I've just realized that myself, actually. Yeah. They're always enjoying it. So, um, so the menu that you have, um, we believe this to be the world's first completely edible menu. With the previous menu, we looked to the past when memory triggers, aroma. Now we look to the future with flavor and dreams and desires in a completely edible menu. There's a couple of links between this menu and the last one. So if you all don't mind taking the candy shop aroma, the third and final aroma, it's the smell of an old English sweet shop. Yeah, it's based on a 1920s confectionery shop. 
based on candy that was actually stored in a confectionery shop in the 1920s that was obtained by the perfume company that we actually work with. So we're able to analyze the headspace of the oxygen inside the candy, and this is basically the scent that came out of it. Um, there is every fourth chair, there is a bag of gummy bears. Again, guys, don't be greedy. I hope you haven't... Yeah, we want you to caring. share them with the people next to you, yeah. okay? You have a little card with it that is essentially, looks like this, okay? These are going to explain to you the 12 gummy bears, okay? Don't look at the ingredients underneath, and this is something else that people don't understand. It's something that took us, what, nearly one year to develop. When you eat the gummy bear, firstly, we want you to suck it for at least 30 seconds first. Let the warmth of your tongue warm it up. When you make confectionery, it's very important that you use an ingredient called capol. Capol is a refined oil made from the starch of potato. This is what you rub onto the confectionery first so that they don't all stick together when they're in the bag, okay? So pass the bags along. There should be three bags per row, okay? And put, pass the menus down as well. Associate the color. Same thing also, color is very important with flavor when you look at the color. But for example, how do, you, how do you make something that tastes of a baby? How do you make something that tastes of peace or indulgence? For me, revenge is very easy. It's got to do with the Michelin Guide. But, uh, uh, but then you have knowledge, power, last beauty. How do you associate that flavor? So okay. I'll talk you through all the flavors in just a moment. Each one of the gummy bear is representative of one cocktail, the main flavor of that cocktail, and the dream and desire that it represents. So every single guest who comes into the bar at Tipling Club gets one bag of gummy bears to themselves. We make 1,200 gummy bears every single day in the test kitchen upstairs. I know you think you like gummy bears factory. until you have to make 1,200, and then I can't even eat Haribo anymore. Yeah. yeah. So starting on the left there, we'll work uh, through all the flavors. This is the revenge bear. So when we, um, when we sat down and we were doing the R&D, and we turned to IFF and we said, do you guys, is, is there a blood flavor in existence? And everybody in the room started laughing. And they were like, oh, well, what's going on? What's the joke? And it's, they said, why do you think meat in supermarkets tastes like meat? This is essentially the only dark dream and desire. So we had a little bit of umami in there as well, just to give it a, a different mouthfeel. Next up, we have the indulgence, very indulgent flavors, chocolate and strawberry. The purple bear, it's like, you know, whenever you get a bag of sweets, like a mixed bag, there's always one flavor in there that you really don't like, but some people do. This is the one for me. This is supercar. So it's flavored with petrol, smoke, leather, and metal. Next up is the little gray bear. This is knowledge, flavored with whiskey and paper. Next which makes most sense for me for the holiday bear is pina coladas, and there's some sun cream flavor in there as well. Following up that, we have the peace. It's flavored with uh, jasmine and almond milk. The success, uh, flavored by uh, Domaine Romani Conti, uh, our favorite Rhine. Then we have the lust. Uh, the lust is my favorite flavored bear. If you want to talk about the lust. <laughs> So ironically, lust is an interesting one. Um, a lot of these, some are very obvious. Again, supercar wasn't that obvious because we used truffle oil in the gummy bear, but truffle oil, if you don't know, the chemical used in white truffle oil is the same chemical that goes into making racing fuel. That's right, dipithylene 4. Exactly. What was the name again? Dipithylene 4. Thank you very much. Yeah. But indulgence, very easy. We use a very expensive red wine. We take the flavor from the red wine. But Lust, we actually sat for two weeks with a perfumer from Paris, and we asked, how the hell do we make Lust? Because everyone perceives Lust in a different way. So I chose the scent of my wife. Mm. And uh, it turns out that the perfume she uses is Coco Chanel. Mm. Now, Coco Chanel was actually invented to incite Lust in men. So it's very easy. And I don't know if anyone knows what Tonka beans are. Tonka. So it's banned in a lot of countries. It's actually banned for us in Singapore. We had to get the guys here in Zurich to get it for us for the drinks that we were serving the yeah. other day. Hand smuggle it in. Please don't tell the authorities. Yeah. But uh, Tonka, Tonka is a... It's a natural it's, aphrodisiac. It's a, it's a natural aphrodisiac and it's also a stimulant. It works the equivalent of one gram of Tonka to one gram of coffee. One gram of Tonka is the equivalent of eating 
25 espressos, it's a stimulant, so it gets your blood racing, gets your blood pumping. Mm. So it's, the fun thing is, and what we're trying to explain as well, is it's about understanding this stuff. It's about develop, d discovering these things as we go. And the more we discover, the more we can apply to the food and the drinks that we're creating. That's right. So the next bear is the power. Uh, again, very powerful flavors, spice, fire. And uh, next is a bit of a controversial bear, the baby pink bear. Can everybody here put their hand in the air if they, were, if they like vanilla? <laughs> that means you were breastfed. Yeah, you like boobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, natural vanillins that occur in breast milk. So anybody who takes to vanilla, 99% of the time, it means they were breastfed. Yeah, next. So the final bear, or sorry, the last two bears is happiness. This is uh, flavored with uh, citrus and honey, and then beauty is flavored with rose and makeup. The makeup element is um, an edible clay found in the plains of West Africa that some people might know in the room. It's called cowling clay. The pregnant women eat it out there to get the nutrients they need for their unborn uh, children. It's very minerally, very alkaline, adds a really nice uh, element to the cocktail and to the bar. So we're gonna make for you um, our, uh, arguably our most popular drink from this menu. Uh, this is the happiness. So this is essentially a textures of citrus drink. Uh, we have yuzu. We have lemon juice. We have honey, just to balance out the acidity. Then we have uh, orange flower water. Just three tiny drops. And then we have the diamond ice vodka. That's going to be given a quick shake. And then uh, Chef Ryan is going to finish the drink off with our garnish. So the garnish for this, um, it's a bit of fun. Using citrus, we use a two-dimensional printer that uses food ink. Um, we print this onto a, a rice paper that's basically put through, put through the printer. Take the rice paper, the actual uh, smiley face is, is, is to represent what we're, what we're talking about. But the beauty of this is, is uh, I, was, I was fascinated by a thing called Space Invaders as a kid. And we had these little candies called Space Invaders or UFOs. And we tried making them at the restaurant for months and months and months and it didn't work. And then we discovered this technique. So just using rice paper through a food grade bubble jet printer, we put the two pieces of rice paper together using a heat sealer plastic heat sealer for plastic. We just mold the two pieces of rice paper together. Takes a few seconds. Pop it open. Then inside, we add a sherbet. Just push it down. You got a tweezers? Got a pen. So, you got a pen, <laughs> that'll do. And so, then we just heat seal it together, form it in. And this is basically this. That's it. So this drink is dissolves on the palate. A, a textures of citrus drink, right? You've got the orange flower water. You have the yuzu from Japan. You have lemon juice. So we're like, what is citrus? Citrus is acid. So it comes with a passion fruit LSD tab. And that's good idea. <laughs> You know, this is, a, this is part of our thought process for the garnish of the drinks. You know, we're one of a handful of places in the planet where me as a bartender, I'm so fortunate to be able to work with um, chefs of the caliber like Chef Ryan and Chef Fayo at Tipplin Club that we really want this to come across in our drinks, you know? It's a little bit of fun. It talks about, it's our symbol of being a restaurant bar. So why do we do these concepts? You know, why do we invest so much time and so much work into, into a cocktail menu? There's a number of reasons. The first one is it's an engagement tool. You know, like uh, in Singapore, people can sometimes be a little reserved. So we put that down in the table and automatically they're open. They're asking you questions like, what is this? You know, like people want to show the friends. They want to put it on social media. Say if you're in the bar having a couple of cocktails and then you meet your friend the next day, uh, for a coffee, you, you bring it, you show them, look where I was last night, I had some edible gummy bears. 
We actively encourage people to steal the menus. So everything on the seats today, please feel free to steal it. <laughs> it's uh, also an experiential tool. You know, we're very fortunate to live in a world today where good food and good drink is no longer good enough. Guests are expecting a little bit more for the money. And these little things really help feel, make them feel that they get that little bit extra, you know. Awesome. Uh, so these are an example of some of our other drinks from Tipling Club. Like Ryan said, every single thing that looks like it could come out of a pastry kitchen is actually made by one of the bar team. Something that we had to adapt to quite quickly, learning how to quinelle for the bottom left one was quite challenging at first. Yeah, I'm sure there's just chefs in here. Yeah. If you ever seen a bartender try to make a rocher or a quinelle, it's hilarious. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not. <laughs> That's probably, we could show them how to use a freeze dryer, rotary evaporator, yeah. a centrifuge, yeah. but trying to get them to make ice cream that goes perfectly like that on your hand was the hardest challenge with that's the bar right. team. So the garnish on the bottom left, that's actually um, a miniature pear sorbet. So Ryan, would you like to talk about the pear? Pear sorbet, again, it's, uh, it's flavors of like a tartatan, but we use a, a technique of fat wash. So a bar technique, that then we stole in the kitchen. So by taking burnt butter and water, blending them together in a centrifuge and then separating them, we now have water that tastes of burnt butter so that we can actually make a sorbet because a sorbet is, is a water-based product, not, a, not an ice cream which contains fat. So we make a sorbet of water that tastes exactly like burnt butter. We flavor it with roasted pear. We then dip it into a gel that's based with kappa that's made from just pure pear extract. We top it with a little vanilla pod, and then Joe makes a drink to go with it. That's right. Just before it hits the table, we torch the dehydrated vanilla bean, adding an extra element of aroma to the drink. In the middle, this was the rain cocktail from the blotter that you smelled. It's my favorite drink from the previous menu. Maybe it's because I'm from Manchester, where it rains literally every single day. <laughs> On the top there, we have, uh, we have a microwave sponge. Uh, a little bit of yogurt in there. Put it into the microwave for one minute. Rises up, rip it up, and dehydrate it. The bottom uh, right, we have the peace cocktail. Um, so the garnish on top, that's actually a lemon meringue. It's not a French meringue. It's not an Italian meringue. It's a Swiss meringue. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ram, uh, uh, right, whatever. <laughs> uh, the top right there, we have uh, the campfire. Um, in there, we, we do a technique um, where we essentially heat the milk up with vanilla. All the proteins uh, rise to the top in the casings. We take that out because whenever you mix uh, protein and acid, the acid starts to cook the protein. Even in drinks, you can feel that reaction. It's very subtle, but we need to remove that. So essentially, you've got like a, a skimmed vanilla milk. We make a toasted barley syrup to get through some of the earthy, woody flavors from the campfire and finished off with a campfire flavored marshmallow that guests used to toast at the table themselves. Sorry in the video. Done. Cool. That's it, guys. Yeah. Come to Singapore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. Is anybody, if anybody has any questions in the front row, front few rows, otherwise you can shout. You understood everything we said? Yeah, because we have got a quiz now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and we're giving away a trip to the Swiss Alps. Yeah, yeah, no. Easy. <laughs> Get off. Oh my goodness. Habt ihr alles kapiert, wie das läuft? Ihr könnt jetzt heimgehen, an eurer Bar stellen oder im Restaurant gemütlich hinhacken und genau das machen, was die Jungs uns hier gerade vorgemacht haben. I already told you the public, now you can go home and all the same, what do you do in Singapore? I don't think so. What is, what is the development and research time behind those, those dishes and especially those drinks, those cocktails? Menu takes up to, up to nine months to 11 months mm. to develop. Uh, we have about seven to 12 meetings with the perfume company mm -hmm. where we saw in the video, we go to the collaboration suite, we sit down and you know, it's bizarre because we're working with some of the world's best perfumers that are coming to us with what they think is the, s the smell of vodka or how does ice smell or, or, or this? And they're coming to us because they're so excited. Mm. And we're like, no. No, it's mm. not what we want. Mm. You know? We've got a guy here, in, a chef here in Switzerland, who made a, a soup out of, of uh, snow. <laughs> and it yeah. smelled of snow and, and, of, and of 
Ja, hä? kennen wir alle zusammen, der Hexer vom Entlebüch, oder? Mm. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, that's part of it. This was about 10 years ago he, he started to do that. And, but where do your ideas come from? I mean, this is incredible. Again, for us, we play a lot with childhood memories. Yeah. We play a little tongue in cheek. Like, we look at fun. Again, we don't take ourselves very seriously. In the restaurant, yes, of course we're serious. Mm -hmm. In the bar, we're serious. When you come as a customer, it is serious. But <laughs> it's, the, thing. I mean, it's like the process that. behind it that. It, it shouldn't be too serious because okay. you look into things too much. We like to just throw it out yeah. there and see if we can do it. But that's but the beauty of it. Was this by accident you, that you met each other or was there a certain plan behind? Or? No, I was stalking him on Facebook. Yeah. He was stalking me on Instagram and then yeah. something happened. Then we matched on Tinder. We matched on <laughs> Tinder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. So. So, no, um, so not only is Tipling Club very respected and very famous in the, in the restaurant world, it's also very famous in the bar world. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I heard there was an opportunity to work with uh, Chef Ryan, I jumped at the chance. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, the stem from that was on Joe's first day, you know, three years ago. On the first day, I said, what, what do you expect from working here? What, what do you want to do? I said, I have my ideas of what, because Tipling Club in our first year, we were the number one bar in the world. We hit number one, and that was it, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. But then each bartender that comes, everybody has a different thought process, and you know, it's very hard to find like-minded people in the industry that actually understand how crazy we can be sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when Joe first opened his notepad next to me, and I'm like, well, what's your idea? He goes, I've got like thinking about perfume and childhood memories and aromas. Mm -hmm. And I had exactly the same ideas on my notepad. It's like, okay, here we go. And that's how we got started, so. I started today with with, with one question, and I, I asked you this question yesterday evening. Um, I mean, when, when a Scotsman, a, hundred, uh, a 220 pounds Scotsman comes in and has your 10 course dinner with uh, all the cocktails and all, the, and all the, the champagne and all the wine, he goes out of the tippling club like this. Yeah. And then a, a small Chinese lady comes in, what happens to her? She walks out exactly the same. Why? It's balanced. What we do okay. is balance. It's not about, it, it, yes, it's exuberant, it's indulgent, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, there's so many courses. We have 14 courses or 24 courses, or it's, it's insane, the amount of food and drinks that will be consumed in a menu. But it is balanced, and it is the speed in which it is served, and the way it is served, and the volume in which it is served. Mm -hmm. So people, everybody will get the same reaction. It doesn't matter about size, it's about metabolism and how you process things. Mm. So for us at the restaurant, a lot of people ask us to slow down sometimes. We're like, no, 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 no. The moment your plate's finished, you're getting the next course, the next drink. And bang, it's, bang, bang. You know, I mean, look, I, I'm good friends with Ferran and something I learned from him 18 plus yeah. years ago. And it's about not letting the person's metabolism take over. It's yeah. about constantly going. Because what I thought behind the scene was this is Molecular Kitchen 5.0. I hate the word molecular. Yeah, I know. You but, should know but, that. You should have done your research. But I, um, <laughs> I, um, I hate that word. But there's not many people that can boast that they actually do that. Mm -hmm. What we do in our R&D kitchen with the scientists we work with, the neurologists, the perfumers, the color scientists, the psychiatrists, that's for me, not for him, <laughs> and then all the other people we work with, we are doing that on that level, but I still, I, hate, I do hate that word, but mm -hmm. it is actually on a molecular level. Some of the stuff we're doing is actually on a well, genuine this is, this molecular level. Well, pure chemistry, I mean, yeah. Yeah. nothing else. But I mean, like, we, we relatively keep all that hidden away until guests want to know more because there's yeah. nothing worse than going into a bar or restaurant where you feel like you're being educated. Yeah. The majority of people go into a bar or a restaurant to have fun and that's what, like we play like Madonna mm -hmm. in the restaurant for example, you know what I mean? But there's little indications on the menus that spark people's interest and if they genuinely want to know more, they'll ask more. For example, blood's written on the revenge. What's blood? What's petrol? And then again, that opens them up and we can have a conversation, we can show them the kitchen, show them the test lab. Yeah. Well, when I, say, when I see petrol and when I see paper, when I see uh, things like uh, makeup uh, in, in your drinks, I mean, laws in Singapore, uh, as far as food is concerned, must not be very strict. Mm. But or those, is, but is those, this quite a, a liberal way to do it? Or? Yeah, I mean, those are essentially another way of describing a simple ingredient. So, for example, if we wrote Caroline Clay on there instead of the makeup, mm -hmm. 
people be a little bit more confused, but the makeup ties into the overall concept and the story of the drink. Each of our drinks tell a story in the flavor, the descriptors, and the garnish. Yeah. If, if you have a look at your website, um, uh, on the pictures you've got on your website, um, uh, there is a, a huge amount of pictures um, from the last 10 years. Yep. And every we catalog every single Every edition, year, every single new yeah. ideas, a, a new world, a yep. completely new f world of flavors, of, of, of tasting, of smelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, where does this end up? Mm. Next, next year, next year or so. We're progressing on to do some new projects. Okay. Uh, myself and Joe, which are very exciting. We can't say too much just yet, but there will be some new changes to what we're doing uh, very soon. Yeah, you'll see it. You'll see it. It's going to come soon. So, so this works on, on, on the client side. I think customers, clients are, are happy with you. This, this will be continued to be developed. Mm -hmm. You know, when we first did all this, and I'm sure, I'm sure, you know what? There's some people in here that just prefer a beer or a gin and tonic or crap wine from a cask, I don't know. But what we do is unique mm -hmm. and it's fun. We're trying to put the fun element back into mixology, bartending, mm -hmm. but also into the restaurant. You know, it's not for everyone. Maybe you don't want to have a gummy bear menu. Yeah. So don't come to the restaurant, we're not interested. We're about people that are like-minded, they enjoy the art of drinking and dining. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So we're about to yes. take that to the next level. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been in Tipling Club for 10, um, yeah, almost eight years ago, in 2010, in April 2010, April, March 10, I don't know. Um, and the development of what you serve since then is quite incredible. But I thought already at that time, one of the best chefs of, of Singapore told me, go there, it's something new, it's something special you've never seen before. And almost at that time, it was the case that I, I haven't seen that before. And now it's, the development was so incredible. Is there, is there any end in, in sight? Or? Oh. No. no, it's as much as he can think about and as much as I can think about okay. and the companies that work with us to support us yeah. will take us to the next level and that will just yeah. continue to keep happening. I mean, I think that my philosophy when it comes to that sort of thing is like innovate or die. Uh -huh. you know? If you want to keep being progressive <laughs> and keep doing cool things, it's, yeah. you need to keep looking forward and keep working. Innovate or die. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Innovate or go home. Or go home. Or yeah. go home. Yeah. One yeah. Or the other. We the kitchen when you don't want any waiting. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, gibt es da noch irgendwas dazu zu sagen? Ich stehe mit offenem Mund hier, nicht weil ich reden muss, sondern weil ich nur staune. Gestern Abend mit den Jungs in der Bar des Storchen, da hatten alle ein Aha-Erlebnis der besonderen Art und Weise. Heute sind wir im Moment etwas platt, bin ich der Meinung wahrscheinlich, weil, weil es so unglaublich ist, was die Jungs hier produzieren. Ähm, ja. Also, ins Flugzeug steigen, 13 Stunden nach Singapur fliegen, nicht vergessen, vorher zu reservieren oder darauf hoffen, dass die Jungs irgendwann zurück nach Europa kommen und hier irgendwas in der Form machen. Lassen wir uns überraschen. I already tell them, go to the airplane, fly 13 hours to Singapore, or hope that you come back one day to Europe. We'll be back. To show us happiness, indulgence, lust, and everything else. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.